Thank you. <laughs> Just Thank waiting you. for your, your cue. Um, thank you very much for having me. I'm going to share my screen so that I can show you some photographs of Iceland while I'm talking about uh, this book. But uh, I'll be, here we are. I think we can all see that. As one of my early readers pointed out, this book is a love song for Iceland. The first time I went there in 1986, I felt that I had found a piece of myself that if not quite lost, had been long suppressed. I originally conceived of this book as a collection of travel essays based on the journals of my many trips. And I drafted some chapters way back in 2009. Then in the summer of 2016, on my 21st trip to Iceland, I took a walk with an elf seer Rahilda Jón's daughter. And that winter, as I like to say, my collection of travel essays was hijacked by the elves. Rahilda and I took a walk in a lava field that she and her elf friends had protected from destruction when a new road was built nearby. We didn't talk much about elves or the hidden folk as we walked, Instead, we photographed lava crags and stacks and pillars, pillows of silver green moss, caves and clefts, and individual lichen splashed rocks. We listened to the wind sighing in the knee high willows and the incessant cries of seabirds, black backed gulls barking, now, 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 and Arctic terns, many terns, with their piercing kriya cries. It was by turns warm and sunny and cloudy and cool, a fine summer's day. The breeze was light, just enough to keep the gnats at bay. The land smelled of peat with hints of salt and sea. We wandered about <clears throat> pointing out plants. I didn't keep a list, but two hours later, back at my hotel, when I wrote up my recollections, I remembered blueberry, crowberry, stone bramble, violet, dandelion, mountain avens, buttercup, butterwort, wood geranium, wood thyme, willow shrubs with pale fluffy catkins and several kinds of grass, including sheep's sorrel, which we tasted. It was sour as limes. Elves cup moss was the only sign of elves I saw. We talked about inspiration. What is inspiration? Why do some places attract artists and spark creative thought? Why are some places beautiful? And how do you define beauty? And we shared an experience that I still can't explain, said Rock Hilder as we left the lava field. Now, do you believe in elves? Looking for the hidden folk, is my attempt to answer that question. A question that seemed to get harder to understand the more that I tried. For years, I found myself wandering through history, religion, folklore, and art, circling back to explore theology, literary criticism, mythology, and philosophy, stopping along the way to dip my toes into cognitive science, psychology, anthropology, biology, volcanology, cosmology, and quantum mechanics. I used to work as a science writer at a university, so my quest took some unusual turns. Each discipline I found defines and redefines what is real and what is unreal, what is natural and what is unnatural, what is demonstrated and what is theoretical what is alive and what is inert. Believing in elves, I learned, is a lot like believing in quantum mechanics. It is a way of perceiving and valuing the world around us. All of the travel essays I had been working on, I realized, shared one theme. Icelanders see nature in different ways than I had been taught to see it. In Iceland, where the geology and weather patterns are as fantastic as anything Tolkien thought of. The imagination is set free 
and the mind is urged to pay attention. In Iceland, I felt more alive, more open to wonder and beauty, because to the Icelanders I met, the world around us, every rock and every hill, is inhabited by elves, yes, but also by stories. Stories shape how you see the world. They determine not only how you think of elves, but how you think of such real things as hills and mountains and volcanoes. The stories we tell protect a place or permit its destruction. That's why it seems to me we make a critical mistake when we laugh off an Icelander's belief in elves. We assume we agree on what each of us means by belief and elf. Think about it this way. If Icelanders are crazy to talk to elves, are Christians likewise crazy to talk to God? What immaterial beings are we allowed to believe in? And who is allowed to do the believing? In 1974, an Icelandic psychologist conducted a survey on spiritual matters. Of those who responded, 5% had seen an elf, while 33%, quote, entertained the possibility of their existence. In 2006, the University of Iceland conducted a similar survey. Again, 5% said they had seen an elf. This time, more than 50% entertained the possibility of their existence. Let's put those numbers into context. According to some recent surveys, 10% of Americans say they've seen a UFO, and 48% of Americans are, quote, open to the idea that alien spacecraft are observing our planet. Or look at it another way. 81% of Americans say they believe in God, and 64% are, quote, convinced that God exists. So is an elf more like a UFO, or is an elf more like God? For folklorist Terry Gunnell, who organized the 2006 ELF survey, the most striking result, that is, in spite of the radical changes in Icelandic society since 1974, the Icelanders' traditional beliefs about elves had remained the same. They were, he concluded, deeply rooted. The idea that some people can see elves and others cannot does have a long history in Iceland. When Rockhilder Jón's daughter wrote to the mayor on behalf of the elves living in the lava field in 2013, she called herself Sjáwendi, a seer. She did not have to define the term. As the Lutheran bishop of Iceland wrote in 1570, elves are invisible to us unless they wish to appear. Yet the properties of certain people's eyes are such that no spirit can ever escape their sight. What are these properties? No one knows. Then again, seeing itself remains somewhat of a mystery. According to neuroscientist Chris Frith, quote, the brain creates the world from the very limited and imperfect signals provided by our senses from our experiences and our expectations, from what we've been taught and what we've read, the brain creates, quote, a prediction of what ought to be out there in the world. Eyesight doesn't answer the question, what is this? But instead, what is this like? Says neuroscientist Moshe Barr, quote, our perception of the environment relies on memory as much as it does on incoming information. In 2010, I met this volcano, Eyjafjallajökull. What was it like? Not a cyclops or a titan, as volcanoes were to the ancient Greeks. The classics did not shape my worldview. My volcano was a dragon, 
Here's how I describe it in the book. The craters sighed and snored like a dragon's nostrils. Whoosh, shush, whoosh, shush, whoosh, shush, whoosh, shush, and snorted red orange fountains of flame. Stars fell down the sides of the new made hills. Lava drops bounced and rolled like gold coins. Black ash peppered the snow. At the tips of the dragon's cooling limbs, the lava still moved, bulging and breaking, tinkling like broken glass, but more rhythmic and musical. As the sun set, the colors bloomed. A fat yellow tongue of living rock oozed over one crater's side. Orange eyes twinkled in the dark arms of rock. The lava fountains turned hot pink. I filled my camera's memory card. I filled my mind until my visual sense was stupefied. When I say dragon, I'm speaking metaphorically. Elf seer Rockhilder Young's daughter is not, but the elf she sees may not look like any elf you will see. Elves have always been shapeshifters. The word is a bottle, the concept a liquid. Throughout history and across cultures, elves can only be seen when they wish to be seen and they can take on whatever shapes they like. Or perhaps what's true about mountains is also true about elves. We see what we've been trained to see, what our education allows us to see. What image comes to mind when I say elf? Do you see Santa's toy makers, the Keebler elves, the Tooth Fairy, Tinkerbell? The elves Rockhilder sees, or at least those in the illustrations of her books, look much like people, though they may be dressed in old fashioned clothes. Some are tall, some are small. Some have pointy ears, some have green skin, but some look like trees. <clears throat> In the earliest stories in English or Icelandic, elves are like gods and goddesses. Think of Tolkien's Galadriel as so beautifully acted by Kate Blanchett. In the tale of Thomas the Rhymer from the 1200s, the elf queen is a beautiful lady on a white horse who kidnaps Thomas and turns him into a sex toy. It was Shakespeare writing in the 1600s who shrank the fairy queen to no bigger than an agate stone, the gemstone in the ring on a rich man's finger. Rather than riding a white horse, she comes in a chariot made from half a hazelnut shell and the gauzy bits of grasshopper's wings. Where once elves were godlike, now they're insect-like. What do you see when I say troll? In the stories I knew, trolls were evil and ugly and stupid. They could be tricked, but they could never be trusted. Then Rockhilder told me the story of a kind troll, a mountain spirit that had saved Rockhilder's neighbor from falling down an icy cliff. That instinct of mine to distinguish evil troll from kindly spirit is a modern fault. We are obsessed with classification. Medieval people were not. Trolls, giants, monsters, elves, any of them might be human enough to have children with. They are all the same species by a modern definition of that term. In the earliest Icelandic texts, troll and elf and dwarf are interchangeable. We really have no idea what those words meant. All are used, writes folklorist Arman Jakobsen, someone somewhat like a modern anthropologist might use the term God or deity. All that's clear about Iceland's elves is that they were once worshiped. Elves were declared evil by the Christian church in the early 1200s around the same time that these poems and stories were first written down. Elf seers were denounced as witches, 
and in the 1400s, in some countries, burnt at the stake. In our day, elves are not so much evil as trivial. Our world has been disenchanted. Everything can be understood by science, we think. Everything can be tamed, even if we haven't tamed it or understood it quite yet. A sociologist Max Weber predicted in the early 20th century, soon there will be no more mysteries, no more magic, no more wonder. Ludwig Wittgenstein found that to be a serious problem. His philosophy, says historian Michael Saylor, awakens us to awe, possibility, difference, and a humble acceptance of the provisional nature of our understanding. Those are things I think about often when I'm in Iceland. Though I've never seen an elf or a troll, I've had several encounters with the supernatural while traveling in Iceland over the last 35 years, once while crossing the cold desert at the island's heart on horseback. Here's how I describe that experience in looking for the hidden folk. One night during that horse trek, jotting notes in our cabin, I felt eyes on my neck. I turned to see a glacier outside the windows stretching across three of them and around the corner like an intelligence looming between earth and sky, gleaming yellow-white, unlike anything real, brilliant, misshapen, awake, a rising moon in wintertime, its edges blurred and shifting, it seemed to breathe. It drew me outside in spite of sore muscles. I walked dead away from it across the tussocky field to the gravel banks of the glacial river. The day was warm now that the clouds had lifted. I took off my boots to wade. The water was not icy in the shallows over black sand. It made me want to strip and bathe, but I was not quite alone. Other riders were about. One man perched on a rock right around the corner. I had never bathed naked in a glacial river before. I had never done, never thought to do, anything remotely like that on all my many trips to Iceland. I waited on, looking for a secret spot. Wind sang in my ears. A golden plover called, beepy, beepy. The roar of the river was louder than either. Wind or birth, but somehow so constant as to mimic silence. A shadow rushed across the sun. I shivered and looked up. Unknowingly, I had turned a circle. The glacier was right in my face. Wings of black cloud rising behind the ice warned me the fine weather wouldn't last. But how long did I have? There was no scale here. I could not guess how far or high that ice cap was. I walked barefoot across warm black sand braided with turf, soft and spongy and squishy with goose droppings. I decided to ignore their provenance. They felt nice between my toes. I picked up a goose feather. A series of jagged peaks behind the glacier puzzled me. They were covered top to toe with snow, while mountains in line with them were wholly snowless and blue. Aha! I was seeing only the tips of high snow-capped peaks, their bases hidden beneath the horizon's curve. The glacier was half hidden as well. The black clouds flew closer. I picked up three rough rounded black rocks to remember the river by and let fly my goose feather as a gift in return. I quickened my pace and was startled to see sheep tracks way out here in the wild. The river now ran a greenish gray, milky with silt, its swirling current deadly fast. The sand petered out. I hauled myself up the high grassy bank, startling geese and goslings, and saw nothing at all around me but river, mountains, ice, and sky. No hut, no horses, no signs of human life. As if I'd stepped through a door into another world, a door into other time. That was a feeling I've never forgotten. 
a feeling that brought home to me how insignificant I really was and how vast and timeless and beautiful and dangerous the earth could be. In 1992, I attended a lecture at the International Medieval Congress in Kalamazoo, Michigan. In Iceland, scholar Gillian Overing noted, the center is the margin. Geography is inside out. People settle on the temperate edges of the island while its interior is a glacial desert, cold, inhospitable, and not even crossable most of the year. What kind of self, she mused, might these places reflect? What kind of self has wilderness at its heart? That's another question I try to answer in looking for the hidden folk. When I first decided to go to Iceland in 1986, I had dinner with some Icelandic students at Penn State where I worked. I told them I wanted to visit this glacier, Snæfellsjökull. They approved. The economists said New Agers ranked the glacier the second most holy mountain in the world after a peak in the Himalayas. The mother of the seismologist who was visiting added, I know what they mean. I have never felt it like I felt it there. She did not define it. Each of my succeeding trips to Iceland has been made or marred by catching sight of the glacier or failing to. My journals are rich with sightings or the wish for them. Went horseback riding for over four hours, I wrote. The glacier kept itself hidden. No glacier. The clouds are too thick and low. No glacier. But some other mountains came and went. No glacier yet. The glacier kept staring at us, beautiful and mysterious. Two horns on top like eyes on a skate the glacier all white. This feeling of being drawn toward a magic mountain is universal. Other writers feel it about Mount Ararat in Turkey or Mount Antake in Japan. The word one writer uses is not magic, but holy. Another word that applies is wonder. Wonder is an emotion. According to philosopher Jesse Prince, it's wonder that produces both religion and science, as well as art. The three institutions that are most central to our humanity, he says, are united in wonder. They are not in conflict. They are not either or. Each allows us to transcend our animality by transporting us to hidden worlds. It's wonder, he argues, that makes us human. It's wonder that is at the heart of looking for the hidden folk. We all tell stories, we always have, but we don't always take responsibility for the effects of our storytelling. The purpose of a story is not to pass the time. The purpose of a story is to help you lead a good life. In looking for the hidden folk, I invite you to join an intimate conversation about how we look at and find value in nature. I hope to reveal how the words we use and the stories we tell shape the world we see. I argue that our beliefs about the earth will preserve it or destroy it. Scientists name our time the Anthropocene, the human age. Climate change will lead to the mass extinction of species unless we humans change course. Iceland suggests a different way of thinking about the earth, one that to me offers hope. Icelanders believe in elves, and you should too. So that's the end of my prepared talk, and I'm very happy to uh, ask us our questions if you have any. <laughs>